I'm Cher Miller. I'm Rob Dietz. And I'm Jason Bradford. Welcome to Crazy Town, where Charlie Sheen is director of the community theater. Winning! Hi, this is Crazy Town producer Melody Allison. Thanks for listening. Here in Season 5, we're exploring false prophets and the dangerous messages they're so intent on spreading. If you like what you're hearing, please let some friends know about this episode or the podcast in general. Now, on to the show. Hey, Jason and Cher, we're kicking things off today with one of my favorite topics. You probably already guessed it, movies. Of course. Okay. Shocked him. And uh, particularly, even a a favorite, sub-favorite, if that's a word, genre uh, is villains, movie villains, uh, really the the, the best characters. Because you've always wanted to be one. Of course, I twirl my mustache incessantly. (laughs) That's why you have that. Yeah. So tell Uh, me, I uh, I, want to know, who are your favorite movie villains of all time? Oh, yeah, this is tough. There's a few that come to mind. There's the James Bond guy who bleeds from his eyes, and there's like <laughs> the Chiffre. There's the guy from a uh, No Country for Old Men. Oh, oh a- Anton uh, Chigurh. He's okay. a good one. One of my oh, no, favorites. No, no. I got it. Though. Dumbo. I got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's it's the guy that decapitated Gwyneth, a pregnant Gwyneth Paltrow, and then displayed what? his head to Brad Pitt oh, in uh, Seven. Yeah, I think uh, he doesn't have a, a name. John in Doe. It. Yeah, John Doe. Right. But uh, played oh. by uh, Kenneth Spacey. Is it? Kenneth Spacey. What's his name? <laughs> Hey, Kevin, <laughs> Kevin Spacey. Kenneth Spacey. I got it though. Who's I Spacey? Think I, I'm You're picking Spacey. that guy. That yeah. guy was bad. That, that's a pretty good villain. Okay, for sure. Thank you. You well, can't, you can't top that. What do you, what do you got to show? I'm gonna go with one that's probably a lot more common, but still, just okay. like you know, just great. Hans Gruber. Who is that? Oh, that is a good one. What's Die that? Hard. Come on. Come on. I don't Hans. even remember. What? Die I remember, Hard? I remember Die Hard, but it was- uh, He was so good. Mel oh, Gibson yeah. it's, and- It's and, Alan uh, Rickman, too. Okay. In a, he, he sort of elevated the role of the villain. But, okay. Yeah, he gave him character. But gave him, I, I know, would substance. far rather meet Hans Gruber than John Doe. That's <laughs> well, no shit. I mean, <laughs> fair enough. Well, uh, I got to give you guys the one villain to rule them all. And okay. I'm not talking Voldemort, because we- already that's dealt with one. Harry Potter last yeah. episode. Sauron's good. Yeah, that's true. I guess that's the true one ruler to, <laughs> to, to rule them. One ring, whatever. Yeah. Uh, no, the one I'm talking about is Brad Wesley. You guys remember him, right? No. No. No, of Who's course that? you don't. So Brad Wesley was the bad guy in the movie Roadhouse featuring Patrick Swayze. Okay. Jeez, <laughs> Jesus sorry. Christ. I don't know. He went right to the uh to the grand uh, I mean I'm thinking Hannibal Lecter. One, one of or the best like movies that. of all yeah I know exactly. Hannibal Lecter, The Joker, right. uh, Norman Bates, you know, sort of your classics. No, yeah. Brad Wesley. Okay. So why? He was played by this guy Ben Gazzara and he also played Jackie Treehorn oh, okay. in the Big Lebowski. Yeah, yeah, that's a great uh-huh. great character. So he he's he's a good bad guy character. Uh-huh. So I think Brad Brad Wesley tops it as one of the the best bad guys of all time because he basically runs this entire town. He's like oh. this evil corporate titan, and he's he's taken over. And there's this scene; uh, it always stuck with me where he's driving this red convertible Ford Mustang down the road, and he's actually singing the song "Shaboom Shaboom" okay. to the radio, okay. uh-huh. and he's like swerving his car back and forth across the lane, just driving how he wants because what he's the, in charge. I own the whole damn town. I'm going to do yeah. what I want. And Patrick Swayze is just coming up the other direction, driving like a normal human being. And he has to like swerve off the road and get the hell out of the way because because uh, mm. Brad Wesley is is taking the whole road. It was just such a good scene to to lay out this guy's character. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so why why do I go through this whole story? Well, our false prophet today, he's been in the news again lately, even though he's already passed away. But Malcolm Gladwell Jesus. wrote no, Malcolm Gladwell <laughs> wrote a, an article about this guy at the end of 2022, hmm. and he ended the article talking about how our prophet was driving back to his, his home. And I'm just going to quote the article. He says, off he drove. When he got to the left turn out of the golf club... He did something odd. Instead of keeping to the right side of the road, as other American drivers do, he decided to drive in the middle of the road with his Jeep Cherokee straddling the yellow line. 
<laughs> Needless to say, the drivers coming toward us were freaking out. One after another, they all pulled off to the right onto the grassy edge of the street, giving him full clearance to continue driving down the middle of the road. He didn't seem to notice. So he did this while Malcolm Gladwell was in the vehicle with him. I don't think it was Malcolm. Okay. I think he's reporting on, on somebody else. But yeah, like somebody yeah. was in the car with him. And so he's just... basically putting a Brad Wesley on. Yeah, yeah. Our, our false prophet yeah. is 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 actually Brad Wesley. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, do you, well, well, who well, is you, our actual our, false yes, prophet? Yes, our, our real one is Jack Welch. Oh, uh, the Welch is great Grape juice guy. <laughs> yeah, I love that stuff. Yeah, yeah. It stains, I got it. it. Stains, if, I didn't it realize that he was so evil. <laughs> if only that's who it was. Oh, uh, it's not him. No, Jack Welch, uh, sort of the prototype CEO. There's a, a writer named David Gels who wrote this book called The Man Who Broke Capitalism, How Jack Welch Gutted the Heartland and Crushed the Soul of America. And how to undo his legacy. Dude, you're like, uh, you're tipping our hand here with that title. Well, come on. We already know he's a false prophet. Right. So. I guess that's true. <laughs> no, yeah. David Gels has done a lot of our work for us. <laughs> Thank you, I, David. I really we want to. Uh, yeah. I mean, we always have to attribute Alana, our star researcher, but she talked a lot about his book. and, and So and the, what follows is a book report. Uh, to some degree, crib notes, yeah. crib notes, <laughs> which is what we should actually like, let's let's set the stage a little bit, right? Yeah. yeah. Before we talk about why we're talking about Jack Welch, let's just learn a little bit about him. He was born in the midst of the Great Depression, 1935. His father was a train conductor. His mother was a homemaker. He grew up in uh, Massachusetts, about 20 miles outside of Boston. You know, so we have to do the rest of this show oh. with a. Uh. Kind I of can't a Bostonian do that. Not, accent. Not even going to try to see, see if somehow Dr. Bill Cow Simmons ever uh, ever yeah. caught us. He would be railing on us. <laughs> Most interesting thing, I guess, I would say about him, him sort of in his childhood is you know he had this close relationship with his mother, who was very influential. He actually said later in life that she was the most influential person in his life, and that he learned everything he he did about leadership from her when he was a kid. She really tried to ingrain in him the value of competition. So she would take his like allowance money, and they would have to play poker with <laughs> it as it, a like, kid. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> um, that's great training to become a business. Exactly, man. it's a real foreshadowing for <laughs> uh-huh. what we're going to get into later. So he then eventually went off to college, got a PhD in chemical engineering. So you know, yeah. he um, got a, got a real education, had some real you know uh, applicable skills in the world. Right. Well, then he takes that education in chemical engineering and. He applies it at one of the most prestigious and largest corporations in America, General Electric. He got his first job in 1960 there in plastics. And well, another uh, another reason to love this guy. Is, yeah. uh, he's just, responsible for all those dead sea turtles out there. Was he the guy in The Graduate yes. that went up to him? Right. He's like, I got that one was word him. for you. Plastics. That was, what, that, was yeah, that was Jack Welsh. That was Jack okay. Welsh. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and very few people know this. Anyway, the plant was in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and a starting salary of $10,500, which may be in 1960 ain't too bad. Yeah. But by 1968, he was heading GE's entire plastics division. Apparently, he was like a super, you know, kind of ultra confident, kind of cocky guy. And at his 1973 performance review, said he would become CEO one day. And of course, he was right. Yeah. Now, I think we should also set a little context for GE, just so folks... They, are, they uh, bring good things to life, right? Yeah. Oh, my God, I know. Brain worms. Poor thing. Brain worms. Uh, and they're not even sponsoring this. God damn it. Gosh, darn. We'll ask, let's ask for some money later. I know. Yeah. yeah that's, okay. I'm just trying to set us up for the future. Thank you. Okay. You make my give, job easier. If you and... give, you you know, you're more likely to get right. in, in return. That's I'm how sure, influencers do this. I'm sure GE is going to just cut us a check. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. They're going to be like, heart. thanks for bringing up that 1978 slogan that we had that nobody cares <laughs> about. that long ago. <laughs> Anyways. So GE, I mean, you know, this goes back to Edison, right? Original member of the Dow Jones Industrial was a, an enormous manufacturing giant, innovated you know, a, a lot, on not just in lighting, but all kinds of technologies, total blue chip company. So when you're talking about becoming the CEO of, the, of this company, this is not like, you know, you guys getting to run the local, you know, Subway sandwich shop no, or something. No, <laughs> Which I know was always your dream, Jason. But. Well, I, I'm more, I want more of those like uh, soft serve frozen yogurt places myself. Oh, okay. nice. Yeah. Right. 
Mm-hmm. I, I just hope someday somebody lets me run anything. <laughs> well, in a uh, in another mustache twirling moment, when when <laughs> when Jack Welch actually became the CEO, his predecessor invited him into his office, and he said, "Jack, I give you the Queen Mary. This is designed not to sink." And uh, this is what Welch said back to him. He said. I don't want the Queen Mary. I plan to blow up the Queen Mary. I want speedboats. <laughs> <laughs> that poor outgoing CEO was like, what the hell? And then he played the theme song of uh, Miami Vice right. as he walked out. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so he gets he gets the uh, the steering rudder of the speedboats at uh, GE. That's a great segue. I'm sorry. That's good. Uh, dude. I'm trying. That's nice. I do my best. Rudder on the <laughs> speedboat. I mean, he's got he's like a little. He's it. holding the tiller. <laughs> he's he's, he's uh, weighed the mainsail or whatever. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> something like something like. A vast ye scurvy dogs. <laughs> okay. All right, go okay. on, please. God, I don't know. If Let's I not pile to. on. Too. All right, all right. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna buck up here. All right, in the two <laughs> decades that 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 Welsh led General Electric, he grew its what they call market capitalization, which is I guess you know you add up all your stock values kind of thing, from 14 billion to more than 400 billion. Wow. And and so it, it, some some parts of that period, it was the most valuable company on earth, right at the top, kind of up and down with Microsoft at the time. Mm-hmm. And the Wall Street crowd, they were just like, they just marveled at this dude because every quarter that, you know, as a, as a, as a corporate, you're reporting your, your, your quarterly report, your earnings. Yeah. Right. And he just always seemed to hit the numbers quarter after quarter. Even after in quarter. recessions. Didn't and, matter. He yeah. was Jack, Jack, you could rely on Jack. Well, that's what made him a star in the media too. Uh, Fortune magazine dubbed him the manager of the century. Not Jeez. not of the year, right. not of not of the week. He's not employee of the week, right? He's manager <laughs> of the century. Yeah. Uh, the article that they wrote about him, they said he made himself far and away the most influential manager of his generation, most widely admired, studied, and imitated CEO of his time. And they, they're just fawning all over the guy. And they talk about his total economic impact being impossible to calculate because it's it's got to be a staggering multiple of GE's performance. I'm just imagining if you're like one of these corporate guys that has to get on airplanes in the 80s and fly around for meetings that as you're as you're in the airport you're constantly going through like like bookstores and magazine rack things yeah. and th- there's probably a Jack Welch cover picture on books like every week or oh. something in this period, right? Like like magazines, probably. Magazines yeah. and like books ring around, but whatever. Just this must be just insane how much Welsh just mania there is, right? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. So he was what CEO for like twenty years. After his retirement, he became sort of like a business management guru. He he wrote autobiographies and two best selling management advice books with his wife. One of them was called Winning. <laughs> Co-author Charlie Sheen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, winning. And then Winning the Answers. Wow. Yeah. God. Winning. I, I almost titled my book that. And I know Richard Heinberg <laughs> almost titled his last book that. You know, winning. You gotta, I, I, I had to differentiate, so I went with losing. <laughs> In 2009, he launched the Jack Welsh Management Institute MBA program, right? Uh-huh. So you could actually go to his school wow. and get an MBA. And uh, and then he he actually died recently in in 2020. So he's I think is the only false prophet that uh, we're covering that is actually dead. But he's recently dead, and, and he's very influential still. And so he's we, alive still in my heart. Yeah, of course. Well, yeah. it's really interesting because you know we talked about how everybody was fawning all over him. He's been kind of back in the news or the press lately because of a reassessment. So yeah. you know David Gell's book, Malcolm Gladwell's article. There's a lot of recent sort of post-mortem articles to kind of reassess. And uh, so, you know, that's why it's almost easy for us to dig up some of this info. But let's let's turn this to why everybody's looking at him. And it it's really his idea around running the company solely to maximize shareholder value. And of course, while you do that, you got to line your own pockets with the, with some of that value. So, uh, you know, David Gels in his book, The Man Who Broke Capitalism, which we, we highly recommend, he kind of sets the stage. He, he says, 
For the 50 years before Welch took over, corporations, workers, and the government enjoyed a harmonious equilibrium. Most companies paid decent wages, employees put in their time, just about everyone paid their taxes. Get this, regulations were accepted as necessary safeguards, and the government invested in things like education and infrastructure. Well, yeah, that all began to change. Yeah, definitely. And um, part of what the change stemmed from was ideas from academia that were um, promoted out of the Chicago School, like economist, uh, crazy town hall of shamer, Milton Friedman. <laughs> you're, you're bringing up one of my favorite people. <laughs> we did a whole episode. We talked about Milton Friedman in uh, in our episode about neoliberalism. Yes, exactly. So this he's definitely in the neoliberal mold. And basically, the idea uh, of these guys was... To, to, to reimagine the purpose of corporations and their roles in society as basically, you know, forget all this. You, you shouldn't care about the broader community so much, you know, your employees. It's basically this narrow, narrow focus to maximize profits for shareholders at any cost. So the idea was markets needed to be freer, get rid of uh, the government interference. And basically, these ideas were fomenting in these the kind of right-wing academic circles for quite a while. Yeah, and the think tanks, and too, the think that tanks came up. too. Yeah. yeah. It was all part of that Powell memo kind of strategy, yeah. right? Yeah. They're trying to Coke influence Brothers. the media, introduce yeah. influence academia. They're upset if, about the EPA being formed and all these other regulatory agencies. Yeah, worried. I mean, that was that was when everything went to shit <laughs> in this country. <laughs> you know, we want that right we want that river in Cleveland to keep burning. That was I interesting. Know. How are you yeah, supposed I mean, to read at night without a big bonfire? You could, you up could the cut sky. your electricity bills. <laughs> Who you know? needs bald eagles? You don't need light bulbs when the river <laughs> on fire. <laughs> so essentially think of Jack Welsh as the guy that took all this seriously and put these theories into practice. And of course, this parallels the Reagan era. So you have Reagan coming in to office after Carter in 1980, Jack taking over as CEO, and then all this sort of economic theory pushing this movement. Oh, it's like a beautiful synergy. It, it was. It's beautiful. It was morning in America. Oh, you know, so beautiful. Yeah, and I think the point with Reagan was this was part of the strand of of the the Powell memo and that neoliberal playbook is change the regulations, change laws, mm -hmm. change the structures and the rules that that corporations have to play by. I think it's important though to understand again, just understand how radical of a shift in a sense this is, which is not to paint like the rosiest picture of corporations before Jack Welsh came around, right? right. Like. There might have been some kind of equilibrium, as you, as you talked about, Rob, but I'm sure it was it was not an easy one. Well, and right? let's uh, let's not forget that that was probably uh, almost entirely for white employees. There was serious structural problems. Yeah, with, in, in enforcement with of regulation, in America. Right? It was yeah. it was it was forced upon yeah. uh, uh, businesses. But but think about what GE was like right before this. I mean, there was this. Huge, enormous company, manufacturing giant, building things for power plants, light bulbs, electric motors, x-ray machines, turbines, medical scanners. I mean, just a whole range of products that they made. And I think one of the key things here is the way that they treated their employees before. Remember, GE was around for a long time, right, before Jack Welch took over. I mean, go back to 1922 and, and the CEO of the company at that time stated, and I quote here, the GE practiced what he proudly called welfare capitalism. Pretty amazing to yeah. think about, right? That concept. Using the corporation's vast resources to take exceptional care of its employees, providing a profit sharing plan, health benefits, higher wages, and more, all in an effort to boost morale and inspire workers, right? And that philosophy, it persisted for decades. In their 1953 annual report, they touted how much the company had paid in taxes that year. Like, <laughs> so the opposite of what we know now, right? Yeah, tax is a cost to be minimized, right? Yeah. And, and I mean, just it, the values were so, so profoundly different. That was the, that was the landscape. You know, when Jack Welsh said, fuck Queen Mary, I'm getting right. on the speedboat. It's the idea that these are corporations that are are there not just for their owners in the strict sense, the, the shareholders, but the broader society has has a there's a stake that everyone has in this company. And we're going to we're going to try to treat people a little bit more fairly. And and, and, and again, it wasn't perfect. It wasn't but, perfect. No. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's uh, to get to the perfect. Let's talk about Welch's uh, arrival and in, in, in his uh, quote improvements. 
Now, at this point, we can say that he's twirled his mustache into braids, I think, or something. Like, <laughs> I mean, how did long is this? Did he have a mustache? Anyway. Did he really? I have no idea. Okay. I, don't, I don't think so. But. I think he was kind of balding. <laughs> his figurative, metaphorical yeah, oh, it's a mustache. metaphorical mustache. I like right? it. I like this mustache. <laughs> so his three improvement strategies for running GE are probably anything, maybe his, his household too, is, was uh, downsizing, that's strategy number one. Strategy number two is deal making. And strategy number three is financialization. So let, let's start with this first one, downsizing, because we're going to have to break this down. Basically, Welch viewed, kind of like we just said about taxes, he viewed labor, his uh, people, as a cost, not as an asset. Sure. And so the idea is get rid of as many as you can. And he had four tactics for for getting rid of those those pesky human resource costs. So All right. Well, let, let's, let's let's start with the you know kind of the the most obvious, which is let's just laying off a massive amount of people. When he came on as CEO, he took uh, an axe in middle management. It's kind of interesting to <laughs> yeah. like to think about this a little bit. We've we've talked about bullshit jobs before. Yeah. We've talked about I think Jason, you talked about primary, secondary, tertiary, tertiary economies. Yeah. You know, we've talked about sort of the management class. Yeah. You know, scientific the, management. The well, professional managerial let's not, class. Let's not forget in the pandemic, we learned what really were the crucial jobs. Exactly. And uh, probably not these. So, so on like at first blush, it's kind of like, oh, okay, you got rid of middle yeah. management. How necessary is middle management? But so he shut down entire departments at the headquarters. He reduced the headcount significantly by more than half in the case of staff at headquarters. By the end of 1982, 35,000 employees have been fired. Now, most of those were blue-collar workers. So he may have started with middle management, but then he quickly spread out from there. That was almost 9% of the workforce. And then another 37,000 were let go the following year. And this is this came at a time where their profits were stable. They had healthy earnings of one point five billion dollars. Their income was up seven percent. So it wasn't just like, oh my god, we're in financial yeah, we're trouble, in trouble here. We gotta cut. So, so I just picture Jack Welch coming in, and you know, I'm sure he's going to dinner and having lavish stuff. But his whole time in the in the office, he's just running people in, fired. You're, You're fired. fired. Uh, fire. He's probably asking other people to do the fire. Can you go fire the seventh floor? Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of people to go through. So you probably had to, you know. It is amazing. Like, they're they're massively profitable and stable. And it's like he's saying, I don't want the Queen Mary. I, I want speedboats. I'm going to sink the Queen Mary. Yeah. This is what he meant. He, take him for his word, man. He <laughs> yeah. did it. Yeah. Well, here, here's the other technique. This is fantastic. This is fantastic. It's called the uh, vitality curve. And the other term was uh, rank and yank. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> basically, the managers, those who were left, right. the few managers left, were ranking their employees annually. And the bottom uh, 10% were basically let go. And <laughs> Welsh defended this. So tactic. it's like Hunger Games kind of. It's kind of, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or there's like some kind of stand on this carpet, please. And then they just pull it out from <laughs> under them or what? <laughs> and he says, uh, he says, quote, some think it's cruel or brutal to remove the bottom 10% of our people. It isn't. It's just the opposite. What I think is brutal and false kindness is keeping people around who aren't going to grow and prosper. There's no cruelly like waiting and telling people late in their careers that they don't belong just when their job options are limited and they're putting their children through college or paying oh, off big mortgages. Much better to do it when they just have children, brand new, yeah. you know, So kids. kind of yeah. Jack. So nice yeah. I mean, yeah, okay, I've had, I've had people that I've worked with, so I'm just going, are you kidding me? Like, there's no way they should <laughs> be Are doing... you talking about me right I'm now? Not, <laughs> I'm looking at you, but I don't mean you. I mean, I get that, that like, I get kind of what he's saying. It's like, if someone's not fit for the job, you just got to get them out of there, of course. But of course, I think how this can be abused, right? It's like the managers are ranking everybody, and I don't know that that's that can be pretty. And pretty the employees personal. know that they're being ranked, yeah, right? Exactly. So it's like what you know, yeah, who's incent- the biggest suck up, right? Yeah, what, right. what what kind of what does that incentivize? Yeah, you know? not not good. Yeah, well, uh, I'm going to run through his other two tactics for uh, for yanking people out of the building, outsourcing and offshoring. So, you know, outsourcing is sending it off to uh, some contractor, right? Well, that's what I was saying. He outsourced the, the job of firing all these people. <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah I, I, he probably had to bring on a big staff to, to fire. <laughs> fire the so and then he fired them. them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, of course, offshoring, uh, you know, he sent 
tons of jobs to countries that had uh, workforces that didn't expect uh, the same pay rate as, as Americans. So a lot of GE jobs went to Mexico, Brazil, and India. 20,000 of the jobs went, went overseas. A, a funny note is in, in his autobiography, he just called this practice globalization. It's a nice, yeah. uh, nice yeah. innocuous term for, for yeah. that. All this downsizing, by the way, earned him a nickname, Neutron Jack. And that's uh, because a neutron bomb kills people while leaving buildings intact. I remember <laughs> having nightmares about Reagan and the neutron bomb when I was a kid. I yeah, was like, little did you know, it was yeah. Jack Welsh. Yeah, it, was like, talking it, it about. would have been just like you were an employee at GE. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that's that's uh, downsizing. You said that was the first one. What's the second yeah, one again? Yeah, the second one is deal-making. Okay, so deal-making. So this is basically mergers and acquisitions, right? He transformed the company from a manufacturing business primarily with a proud history of building all kinds of things into sort of this hodgepodge of a bunch of unrelated businesses. GE made almost 1,000 acquisitions during his tenure there <laughs> wow. in 20 years. That's, that's 50 a year. That's one a week or so. That's These fucking 20 years. insane. That's one a week you're doing an acquisition. Have you right. have you ever bought 1,000 of anything? Maybe like <laughs> rolls of toilet paper Probably or something? Probably in my life. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but, how complicated is it to buy another business? It's ridiculous. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Apparently for them, they, they did it. Maybe they didn't do a lot of due diligence. I don't know. They spent $130 billion buying companies uh, when, when he was CEO. I wouldn't uh, think that, that this would be a fun thing, but it would be interesting to, to look at what were those thousand companies and like how, how different were they? Yeah. How, how um, like a true hodgepodge, you know? Like, yeah. yeah. Well, th- I mean, this, this basically was the leading edge of what, what ended up being called the merger and acquisition boom. And it ends up, of course, concentrating corporations in many industries into you know, fewer and fewer companies. So that's it, may, it creates less competition. This is interesting because it's a, it's sort of a no no in the sense of fairness and competition. Yeah, it's and, like playing the game Monopoly. There's one right. winner in the end. Right. Has- so this is driving it more towards that, but. He, it worked uh, in terms of like creating shareholder value. And yeah. so all these other companies then I think looked at that and said, well, we better copycat. Mm-hmm. Well, let me give you the third strategy for increasing shareholder value that it, to me is kind of the most nefarious and that's financialization. This is where GE basically started doing loans and interest and financial wheeling and dealing rather than making and selling stuff. So when Welch started as the CEO of GE, they had this arm, uh, it wasn't called it at the time, but it became known as GE Capital, right? And it was pretty small, but uh, he recognized this as some kind of cash generating, hmm. you know, super, uh, super wing of the, the company. And it grew from $11 billion in assets to $370 billion by the time he retired. Wow. Kind of against his playbook of downsizing the staff of GE Capital went from 7,000 employees to 89,000. And I know we're throwing around a lot of numbers, but 89,000 employees. Just doing financial stuff. And this is from a company that used to actually make real things. Yeah. And suddenly <laughs> they're laying off people that actually build something and they just have people you know, moving money around. Moving money yeah. around. Yeah, it, it was Unbelievable. thought of as almost a, an unregulated bank that offers loans and insurance products and credit cards. Like, why is GE issuing credit cards? Well, the other thing that, that they did is they used you know GE Capital, the sort of like this whole thing, this financialization to move around dollars to help them meet or beat earning targets. Uh, and that's part of what helped them. You know, you talked earlier, right. Jason, about like all the like 80 quarters in a row, they, yeah, they hit, hit their targets, right? And, yeah. So they kind of did some manipulation, you know, using these financial mechanisms to, to, to do that. And uh, there are least dubious, if not illegal, right? Um, they, they had this like financial army that was that was put to the task of closing quarters the way that they said they would, right? Uh-huh. So, which if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because, you know, you're able to quickly move things. If you think, oh, we're not going to hit our target, we could basically use this cash you yeah. know, to be able to do that. They got in trouble in 2009 with the uh, U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. They had to settle a case. I'm sure – it was pittance. Yeah, right. You know, in terms of whatever <laughs> fines that they had to pay for. But they yeah. did, they probably met that quarter's earnings, uh, you know, just fine. You know, <laughs> even after, their, uh, after they had to pay out. So, 
You know, I I agree. I think I agree with you, Rob. I mean, the downsizing probably had the most dramatic impact on lives on some level, right? right? But financialization, in a sense, is like the most, I don't know, devious or you know, we've profoundly about- impactful. There's a legitimate role for finance. If you're if you have a moneyed economy, you need people who understand it and can move things and whatever grease the wheels of trade, I guess if you want to put a metaphor to it, but it's a cost. I mean, we're they're talking about labor as a cost, but to me, the financial wheelings and dealings is a cost to be minimized, and yet during right. this period and in this company and in a lot of companies that emulated it, it became the goal. Like people want, like that M&A boom you're talking about, yeah. Jason, people wanted to be the M&A guy uh, on that desk at the investment bank. And it's like, we should be minimizing these people. And instead it was like a glamour job. With- well, it's, it's like a parasite economy because all parasite. those banks who are, who are basically managing those M&A deals, they're getting fees. I mean, yeah. we saw this, by the way, we saw this in, in 2009, we, you know, what was happening with, you know, all these companies that went in, into the shitter, the banks were like making money selling all these messed up instruments. And then they were making money on mergers and acquisitions when when the market went to shit. You yeah. know, the same thing was happening with, with the fracking but industry. But at least they all went to jail. Oh, yeah. Right. They all went to jail. <laughs> now, again, we have to keep in mind, what was the ultimate goal here? Maximizing shareholder value, right? Yeah. That's like the big... You know, it was part of that shift that that Milton Friedman put it, you know, helped put into into place, and and Jack Welsh kind of operationalized. And and one of the things I want to talk about is one of the the ways of doing this, of providing that benefit to shareholders, that I think is so fucking evil and has become really ubiquitous is this whole idea of a stock buyback, right? So the, the, the company is buying back its own stock. It means that there are fewer shares outstanding, which means that the value of the stock goes up, right? right? And he, he really drove this. He uh, orchestrated the largest stock buyback in history in the early 1980s after the Reagan administration did away with the rules that prohibited that from happening, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, some work was done to sort of look at what would happen if the money that had been spent on buybacks and dividends over the last 45 years since, right? So yeah. keep in mind, and, and, and I think we'll talk later about some examples of, of how these have been put into practice, but it's become a really common practice. And uh, somebody you know, did, did some... Um, some number crunching on this. If the money that has been spent on buybacks and dividends over the last 45 years have been put towards wages, full-time American workers would be making $102,000 annually on average, double what they're making today. It's just ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. and uh, Just think about that. You didn't even really talk about who benefits from these buybacks. It's not just that the stock price goes up, but who owns the stock? Of course, the CEO and the the top executives. Right. It's always part of their I mean, that's a big part of their compensation packages, right? right? So they're personally incentivized to do this. It's not just like they're benevolently thinking, (laughs) uh, you know, our fiduciary responsibilities to our shareholders. It's like- I, I'm winning. I'm, I'm having an a share moment. I'm about to start bleeding out of various orifices. Well, you know, this is, you talk about the supervillain, right? So at first you think, well, how could some corporate CEO be a supervillain? How can he compare to the people we talked about? You know, the Voldemorts and the and the, the Brad the, Wesleys. Yeah, all that. The Jackie Treehorns. And you think about it. So my supervillain, the one I talked, this is the seven guy. Yeah, you know, John Doe. He, he like kills seven people. All right, whoop de doo. Yeah. If you think about what. Mayhem this guy created, how many lives were like destroyed based upon this? And you were to do like some sort of epidemiological study. Yeah. I bet there's just a massive body count through like alcoholism and drug overdoses and failed failed oh. relationships. Oh, I think we're gonna talk about that. Like, what are some of the implications? That's why of all he's this? manager of the century. <laughs> Okay. Exactly. Well, All right. Well, what what yeah. kind of species is yeah, he? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's get to the heart of this of this episode, where we <laughs> the important re- part. Yeah. We'll review the taxonomy of the false prophets and freaking um, biologists, man. Yeah. I want to. I wanted to say that when you're doing taxonomic work, what you're doing is you're circumscribing species and you have to have a species concept and you're applying that to the individuals you see in a population to come up with maybe sort of a clustering and a a cohesive unit. But I must say that every once in a while, there Mm. is what you might call a sport, um, you know, hey, sport, (laughs) 
<laughs> you mean like baseball? Like uh, oh, with an off type individual, you know, uh, that that doesn't exactly fit your criteria for that species, but you still might put them there because if you don't have a lot of other examples of individuals like that, you can't necessarily say it's independent. Create a whole yeah. separate because yeah. there are there are just there are outlandish individuals in a species. It's, it's like a, a weird branch in the evolutionary tree. Then it's just a, it's just someone who's like far off on the end of some sort of distribution curve. You wouldn't necessarily call mm. them a new species, but they're it's like those weird marsupials in Australia. They're in, kangaroos. No, koalas. they're a, they're a nice tight. <laughs> All right, I'm going to shut up. That's a real yeah, species. You know, I don't know what I'm talking about. You go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, PhD anyway, biologist. Well, okay. So I, I go through my, my key to the species. Yeah. And, you know, he's obviously someone who is working within the system and wants the system to keep performing. I'm talking about the larger socioeconomic system. So he's not trying to blow it up or thinks right, it's he, going to yeah, collapse. Got it. So that's a key distinction between the, I, some of our species actually like – want it all to go down or are waiting for it to collapse. He's holding it together. He wants it to persist. But he sort of wants to blow it up into speedboats, right? Well, that's the I, that's why I'm saying he's this off type. I, I put him in the species Manschiller. Oh, uh, here he comes. Basically, yes. Which is some high status professional, well paid to gaslight you into believing the shit cakes you are seeing everywhere are actually made of chocolate. So- but that, I understand what you're going to get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I, 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 yeah. It's, what's tricky about this, I think it's not giving him enough credit because he's not just carrying water, right? This is the dude that made the bucket that the water is being <laughs> carried in. I mean, he's like, yes, he's. you could say he's he's trying to maintain the system. He's operating Sensu, within the system. Sensu lato. But he's changing the structures of the system. He's really, you know, and he yes. accelerated a lot of, of the shit that yeah. was. So, and these species, it's an evolving evolving community of of and population you see so is that his other nickname besides neutron jack the carrier of the original shit bucket <laughs> <laughs> the inventor of the i can we call it manchiller extreme or extraordinaire or something i mean it's just something like yeah it, it's calling him a manchiller he's not just it makes you a little uncomfortable i understand but yeah. again he doesn't want system breakdown senso lato he what the what does that mean? What do you keep saying this? Okay, for? okay. Well, I this is, lato. No, this is, is a that pre- a coffee? No, it's like is, yeah, I was going to say it's a, like a really sensual latte. This is a pre- pretentious way for me to <laughs> express, you know, how scientific I, and you know, academic. I yeah, am. yeah. Throw some Latin out. There. Yeah, it's just uh, okay. But basically, it means in the broad sense, he wants the system to hold together. While in this narrow sense of what he's doing to corporate culture and standards, he's breaking. So that's why I keep, I apply him to the Manchiller species, even though he does have this outlandish behavior. Okay. Yeah. And the key is that Manchillers are in denial of the big threats we think about. They deny existential threats. Sure. Like I mean, climate change. It, you know, he he's he was on the record before he died, basically yeah. saying climate change is not a concern. What are we worried about here? This is yeah. like a yeah. We're going to wreck joke. everything that he built if we start worrying about climate. Right. Now, look, my taxonomic concepts are, are hypotheses based upon the observation of the data I have at the time, and they can always change, okay? I'm not yeah. precious with these. I just don't want to take any more facts from you guys because you are not taxonomic. We have to acknowledge that the offspring of yeah. this particular being yeah, pretty profound, okay. right? Yes. I and mean, that's, that's evolution, buddies. That's I think evolution. we have to stop arguing over what species this guy is and move on to the implications of right. his... Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So fair enough. So okay. This is what I was trying to get I at. Loved, right? I love debates about this stuff, sure. though, okay? This I, is great. Of course you do. Yeah. We'll, this is we'll, great. we'll arrange a conference next year <laughs> okay. to, uh, yeah. to go over this taxonomic key. I'd love to see you try to do a presentation at some, some like biology conference. <laughs> yeah, like systematic presenting, society. He, you know. <laughs> yeah. Presenting your typology oh, yeah. of false prophets. I think so. People are like, what the fuck is this? guy doing here? Maybe just a poster session. A poster <laughs> session. That's great. You'll be joining the yes men if you're able <laughs> yeah. to pull that off. So, okay. You you said, Rob, let's talk about the implications. And this is what I think I was, I was kind of bristling at. Jack Welsh was like typhoid Mary for capitalism <laughs> run amok. You know, I'm a patient zero or something. Yeah. Like Contagious as hell. <laughs> seriously. Yeah. I mean, his fingerprints are on so much of modern corporate capitalism, right? Mm-hmm. And I think all we have to do is just sort of look at some some statistics, some general trends that we've seen in that time. And of course, it's unfair to say it's all causal back to Jack. But I think a lot of shit comes back to Jack. Mm-hmm. Okay? Yeah, and right he, out of that bucket. He probably loved the pat on the back for that, actually, <laughs> right? So just a just a, a little taste of this, right? Yeah, can we can we go through it? Can can we 
read some too. Of course, I, I, want, I want to be involved. All right. So let me start first. Let's talk about jobs, right? So in 1981, Amer- American manufacturing jobs peaked at about 20 mi- million people. Uh, that was about a quarter of full-time jobs. Today, there are about half of that number of manufacturing jobs. And keep in mind, the po- U.S. population yeah. grew by 100 million people in, yeah. that, in that time period. I, since, I right? want to commend you for using people in that uh, statement. You know, like uh, seriously, I, I think a Jack Welch sees sacks? them as well. <laughs> I'm thinking like resources, right. or workers, yeah. costs, or grist for the mill, labor. Or yeah. what, you know. Okay, my my turn. In 1980. The total value of U.S. corporate deals, mergers and acquisitions, was a few tens of billions of dollars. That total skyrocketed to $1.5 trillion by the time he retired in 2000. What's it now? I know. What's it going to be now? <laughs> $1.8 quadrillion. <laughs> it's a number larger than the number of atoms in the universe. Sorry, we can't report it. Yeah. Seriously, I can't imagine how much has grown in the 20 years since. Okay, here's another one, right? Back in 1980. Companies spend less than $50 billion on buybacks and dividends. By 2000, that number was $350 billion. 20 years since that point, it's now jumped to $985 billion. Almost a trillion That's fucking dollars That's a year how, on how, buybacks and dividends. How are the rich getting richer? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, in 1980, the, the, this is, this is hard, to, hard to look at. The average CEO pay in the top American companies – was one point eight five million dollars? Oh, the poor guys! I, know. I mean, I know that was so. so how things, do they? How do they afford to have four houses? Well, things point? have improved since then. Okay, okay. Thank God. At that time, CEOs made less than fifty times the annual worker's salary, so oh. it wasn't a big. I mean, multiple. they can like they can almost breathe the same air. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's embarrassing. I, Only it fifty is. times. I know. Yeah. Well, by by twenty twenty one. So things have this progress. This is a story of progress. This is yeah. okay. Steven Pinker would love this story. <laughs> the average CEO pay was twenty seven point eight million. Nice, which is three hundred ninety nine times as much as the annual work. That that's more like it. Yeah, nice. Now I like we the trends. Are talking. These are trends. These, These are, are great trends. trends. I, I wonder if they compete with each other. They're like, well, my workforce. I'm five hundred and twenty eight <laughs> times. You're only three hundred ninety nine times. <laughs> no, but Pinker would say relative status doesn't matter to people. It's just their absolute wealth right. that matters. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, broader implication. You know, sort of spreading this out. Oxfam just came out with a report that the richest one percent grabbed nearly two-thirds of all the new wealth created since 2020. That's $42 trillion. And it's almost twice as much money as the bottom 99% of the world's population. Nice. So, And, and that's even compared during the past decade. You thought this was sick. The richest 1% got half of all the new wealth. But now they're getting two-thirds because yeah. these things like stock buybacks are just putting all of the, the new value that's generated into their pockets. I think another another thing to point out is sort of the model, right, of of management and business practices, right? So Welsh you know, instituted financialization, these other mechanisms to try to maximize profits. A lot of it was basically heartless, soulless, whatever. He might have painted as like, ah, we're doing them a favor firing them now instead of later, right, right when they're older. You know, people like Jeff Bezos have taken some of these tactics to to an even further degree, if you think about it, right? So like – Welsh is downsizing companies in terms of their labor force. Bezos is downsizing entire sectors of the economy, right? right? He's like, b- booksellers? We don't need no stinking booksellers. Right. Let's get rid of those guys. Like, just absolutely gutting, underselling entire sectors of the economy, riding them out, basically, you know, dealing with having fewer profits in the near term, which is a little different than mm-hmm. what Jack Welsh was trying to do in order to corner our market. You know, it's yeah. like, it's that sort of ruthless practice mentality, yeah. you know, and, and, and then sort of fetishizing it or whatever, or looking at it and saying, because, you know, people like Jeff Bezos have been rewarded. What, the guy was the richest guy in the world for a little while. Poor, yeah. poor guy got, got passed up yeah. recently. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a little known fact that Jack Welch was also uh, hugely influential on Montgomery Burns. The, right. The head <laughs> of the power plant. We should have, one of us should have picked him as a villain, right? Because, yeah, it's true. Well, look, another implication, uh, you know, we laugh about Bezos and Montgomery Burns, but the 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 rise of the CEO as a celebrity is also something that you can tie to Welch as kind of the ground zero. 
Again, I want to go back to to David Gellis's book, and he really just laid it out. Welch elevated the role of the chief executive from that of a people manager to something closer to a pop star, you know, chasing the limelight, mastering the art of self promotion. Business press adored him. He's on magazine covers. Business schools treated Welch like an oracle, <laughs> turning his strategies into case studies and curricula. Welch was the personification of American alpha male capitalism, a pinstriped conquistador. I love the way Kelly's oh, right. That's a great way to put it. Pinstriped conquistador with the spoils to prove it. And the mustache. I mean, <laughs> unbelievable. Does this remind you of anybody, Jason? Well, my favorite student of, of Jack Welch and my favorite TV show is The Apprentice. Mm. <laughs> and uh, and so. We're, we're no longer friends. <laughs> <laughs> but you just think about that. Like, think about The Apprentice. Go watch a clip if you can stomach it. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of what Trump modeled, obviously, was that kind of ruthless attitude. You're fired kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, You're and also think about it. over the top, you know. You're fired. That's de- like, I guess you call it downsizing or whatever, or like getting rid of the 10%. But also, you know, guy wrote a book called The Art of the Deal, yeah. right? It's all deal making and... Yeah, and that became, in some ways, it became like uh, what we're looking for in our, our elected leaders, right? Yeah. I mean, isn't that part of why people were drawn to Trump? They thought, uh, well, let's bring a business guy in. You see that a lot, right, in people running for office who are successful business people. It's like, well, I ran the company, so I can run this, this yeah. government. I mean, it, it, it is it is super sad that the if you think of the line between – Reaganomics, Jack Welsh, the Chicago School of of Economics and their theories, and then all the stats we just went through of the gutting of the manufacturing, the fact that the middle class is taking a you know, working class wage wage laborers are making a smaller and smaller share, leading to this you know vast inequality, and then someone who personifies that in reality TV shows, the the disgruntled masses then elect that. That guy president, it's just astonishing. Like we are literally putting in on a pedestal, 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 yes. pedestal, and the highest office in the land. The, the the same, you know, sociopathic, narcissistic jerks that that led to the problems everyone's frustrated with. Yeah, yeah, that's a to me that's a huge aha, right? It's like he. He he set the stage like we're gonna worship this guy. We're gonna call him manager of the freaking century because uh, what he was able to fire a bunch of people and make a, a ton of money and and we just buy that he's like some guru genius to follow. But I I also would just want to point out another kind of real world sort of example of this in practice for a second, which is think about the stock buyback thing. You know, we've we've had this situation with with rail workers in the, in this country who basically threatened to go on strike, and mm-hmm. then they were in a sense forced to make a deal by the government with with the rail companies, and and what they were fighting for was not wages. What they were fighting for was just to even have a fucking day off of work sick. once a month. Yeah. You know, if, if they were sick, right? Yeah. Like, and I don't mean like in addition to the weekends. I mean, like one day a month, yeah. weekends included, right? And that was became a huge battle. Now, why did that? How does that relate? Well, these companies have cut back. Yeah, they downsized and downsized. They replaced, you know, human beings with as much mechanization as they possibly could. They cut all their expenses down to the quick, so they can maximize their profits and and do stock buybacks to reward their shareholders, right? And now they don't have breathing room. And now they don't have breathing room. So they have to get these people to go to work. They don't want them calling sick. This is in the middle of COVID, all this shit yeah. is going on, right? And so like, not only are these people, these poor people that, that do these jobs being treated unbelievably badly, but we've created in a sector of the economy that the rest of the economy depends on right this vulnerability yeah, yeah, right? right like the the, the railroads <laughs> are the lifeblood in a sense of moving goods yeah. you know across the country i mean you can move you know? financial you know assets quote unquote assets electronically through 
the banking system wire. There's nothing to do that. Yeah, and so but you, to move you can actual move, real you can goods. move rail cargo through online services, right? <laughs> well, the thing you got these, you've got these the banking industry and these financial people getting paid, and the CEOs getting paid hundreds of times more yeah. than than the people actually move real stuff around. It's right. just maddening. And what's in the risk of all this stuff is that those things will not be moving anymore. So, like, maybe yeah. you don't care so much, or it feels abstract to you that that the people are getting laid off. Do you know what I mean? Or stock buybacks, whatever. No, th- these are the real world implications of these things. Not only are people suffering these jobs, but the the very lifeblood of our economy, you know, is and talk about with globalization as well. It's like we are now really at risk, and then we turn to these very same people to solve these existential <laughs> threats that we that, face. That's what to me is the most maddening. It's like these guys are driving us right over that cliff, and we're like, "Yay, keep going! <laughs> you, you, I want to follow you." Right, yeah. because our metrics for what success is are all financial, right. and so these and guys are winners. We've been rewarding these people for decades. Winning, now. yeah. <laughs> and so we need to reward people who have systemic understanding, uh, who are empathetic, and they're not these 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 like <laughs> these Welshian villains, basically. <laughs> I like that adjective, Welshian. <laughs> Well, I think that leads us into our our next uh, section, Jason. Yeah. Why don't you give us the the uh, r- remind our listeners of our insufferability index? Okay, so uh, we're going to basically score folks on a zero to ten. Like, imagine um, you know. Voldemort would be ten, and uh, and Harry of Harry Potter would be it would be a zero one, very low, right? And so we're scoring based upon their intentions. Are they malevolent, power hungry, selfish people? That would be a high score three. On personality, are they a narcissist, a complete jerk, um, or are they a nice person? Ideas, are they completely wacko, or you know, do they think systemically? Do they have an ecological mindset and uh, understanding of the world? So. So anyway, that's what we're going to do now that we've summarized Jack Welch's life in this podcast. All right. Yeah, let's uh, let's do this. But let me give you guys a few notes okay. before you Okay. You're trying, to influ- the you're trying score. to influence us? No, I, I, I have no – this is all just facts, okay? okay. I am not trying to influence you. I'm just going to tell you some things. We already said that he wrote a book called Winning <laughs> – <laughs> and a sequel called Winning the Answers. Yep. Uh, excellent. Excellent. Coming out of retirement in 2009, he started the Jack Welch Management Institute to train the next generation of Jack Welches. <laughs> <laughs> and explaining why his name was in the title, he said, this is a quote from him, it's mine. I can design the faculty. I can select the dean. I can control the product. Hmm. Uh, His favorite term for firing someone was shot, as in uh, shoot them or they ought to be shot. Nice. On work-life balance, and maybe this goes back to the rail workers, he said, your boss's top priority is competitiveness. Of course he wants you to be happy, but only in as much as it helps the company win. Hmm. In fact, if he's doing his job right, he's making your job... So exciting that your personal life becomes a less compelling draw. <laughs> you forget even who your wife or husband you, is. You don't. You don't need to no. look after the kids. Who cares? Your job is. Uh... Oh, so I, look, you're you're trying to skew <laughs> yeah. the the. I am not. Stop accusing me. Cl- clearly, oh, you got uh, you got something. You don't like this guy. I okay. I, I'll go first. Yeah, he yeah. gets a negative four. <laughs> no, no, no. The, the, the scoring, the, the higher the, high, the point, the worse. Oh my god, I screwed it up. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, he gets the same score as uh, his last bonus when he left GE. <laughs> oh, so like 150 <laughs> million? Yeah, chart. whatever it is. <laughs> oh gosh, you're not taking this. I'm, 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 I'm gonna put him pretty fucking high too, because yeah. there's some stuff about him. Personally, that doesn't sound that great. And on top of just his awful impact on on society as a whole, I'm going to say an eight, probably. Mm-hmm. I think that's pretty. I I mean, I, I, he's definitely you know power hungry, selfish. He's got a three there. Personality, he's a complete art narcissistic asshole. He gets a three. He's not as wackadoodle as as our last. Sure, that's okay? true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, you know, I have to actually say, in in researching him, some of the things he says and writes are pretty damn logical. I mean, they right. lead to bad yeah. outcomes often, but you're kind of like, 
Oh yeah, I'm with you. I, I understand. Yeah. So I mean, he's like, and maybe he's only a one or a two on that, but but you, his you impact. But his yeah. So I go with a two. So I'm up to eight, and then um, you're gonna give him a style point, aren't you? Yeah, nine, <laughs> nine. Okay, yeah. I, I think it's the mustache that set him over, right? I, I like to fractionate, so I think I'm gonna I'm gonna go with eight point five. Okay, he's high up there. This is the this, this is, is the highest high. so far. Because yeah. at the end of the season, of course, we're gonna have to what we're, we're gonna rank, rank and yank. I, <laughs> right? Jack Welch is out of here. <laughs> I think he saved himself probably. <laughs> Other podcasts ask for a lot of stuff. Buy their merch, join their Patreon, donate your left kidney. But we're just asking you to share the show. If you're like me and you find it funny and thought-provoking, then please tell three friends. Hit that share button and get some other people joining us in crazy town. Every decision I've ever made in my entire life has been wrong. My life is the complete opposite of everything I want it to be. If every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. (laughs) All right, do the opposite, for God's sakes, please. You know, the first thing that comes to mind is, why are we worshiping folks like this? Stop Stop the culture of worshiping these folks that think they're so great that they get to they get to earn hundreds of times what a normal human being earns like there's nobody thousands there's nobody that 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 should be paid that much and if they if they're rationalizing or justifying this you gotta you gotta worry about them um (laughs) and so why calling people like that managers of the century you know, we need more people like David Gellis in his, in his book. Um, be skeptical of folks like this and and dig into like uh, what why all the hype, really. Yeah, yeah and, and we're gonna get to people like that. Some of them later on in in this season. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, and I heard a cool story from a friend of mine. He was working at Hewlett Packard when they were going through a downsizing. Uh, I guess they were having some some serious issues, problems, whatever, and they needed to cut costs. And he said, instead of uh, a Welchian nightmare of we're just going to cut 10% of you or whatever, they basically all the staff met and went through some process and agreed, we'll all take a pay cut in order to to get through have a shared sacrifice, yeah. which we talk about often in this show, shared sacrifice. That's the yeah way to get through. They did that? They actually did yeah. that in the corporate situation? Yeah. That's pretty it's, impressive. Well, and it, it kind of harkens back a little bit to what you were saying, Asher, how GE used to operate. You know, it's kind of like, let's take care of our employees. Let's have a community. I, I know there are limits to this. I don't want to sound utopian, but... If you're ever involved or in a decision-making place, there are other ways than just sharpening the old axe and chopping out uh, some some part of the company or the organization. Yeah. Got a couple more quick ones. One is beware of size, right? I mean, I think so many of these mergers and acquisitions lead these companies to be monopolies and enormous, uh, you know, too big to fail um, in, in many cases. And we have very little control. They have a, a tremendous amount of control and influence. So shrinking down the size of, of businesses. And then the other is is instead of outsourcing and offshoring, you know, so much of manufacturing and, and elements of our economy, relocalizing those, bringing those home. Obviously, this is something that we at PCI have been championing for, for decades now. And it seems to be something that's that's being talked about a lot by, yeah, I think, because of the pandemic. Yeah, I think people understand chains. you know the the risks associated with it. So you know we've worked with uh, with our friend Michael Schumann in the past, who's done a lot of work and still doing a lot of work around helping local communities actually do either economic models to look at how they can re-strengthen the, the local economies or other strategies that they can implement, including around food system stuff. And and there's a group called the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, which also does a lot of uh, great work around strengthening local economies as well. Yeah. And we also talked about how Welch's practices led to this huge difference between you know pay if you're already at the top you're the CEO or you're rich versus uh, kind of the rest of us and 
If you want to delve into fixing our troubles with inequality, then you got to check in with our friend Chuck Collins. We had him on this program and uh, goes through a lot of ideas for how to how to adjust things economically. He works at a place called the Institute for Policy Studies. Really recommend you you check out his inspiring work. Yeah, at inequality.org, which is the, the site that his program runs. Uh, let's talk about this stock buyback thing, right? So we talked about how that was deregulated, that was mm-hmm. made possible again during the, the, the Reagan administration. There was a provision that was included in the Inflation Reduction Act uh, that Congress passed recently imposed a 1% excise tax on stock buybacks, which I, I think does not go nearly far enough. So one of the things we could all do is contact our representatives, Senate and, and in the House, and, and let them know that, that we feel like this is a really important thing. And again, maybe make the case and give the example of what I was talking about with the rail companies, mm. the real world implications of putting stock buybacks first. We also saw that actually, we didn't talk about this, but we saw that with the, with the uh, do you guys remember the the crisis that happened with formula, baby formula, there are shortages oh, yeah, yeah. of those. Yep. Well, part of the reason that that happened is the company that was behind that actually did stock buyback rather than repairing the equipment that led to this problem in the first place. <laughs> huh. So we've got real world fucking implications <laughs> of this stuff. And I think you can point that out to your elected representatives. Yeah. Okay. And there are other ways of looking at businesses. If you're in a business, um, you know, look into things like the the B corporations, or they call benefit corporations. There are developments in what's called the perpetual purpose trusts for ownership of of businesses. And these are there are various legal frameworks basically being developed that allow business decisions to include other than financial interests for setting the purpose and goals. Yeah, yeah. Well, and if that fails, uh, financialize the shit out of yourself and uh, maybe downsize. Yeah, downsize a bit, your uh, own body so you don't have to eat as much. Huh. Make some deals. I mean, yeah. Kurzweil has some suggestions <laughs> for how to do that. You know, so I think yeah, I think All it's right. a good strategy. All right. That's our show. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard and you want others to consider these issues, then please share Crazy Town with your friends. Hit that share button in your podcast app or just tell them face to face. Maybe you can start some much needed conversations and do some things together to get us out of Crazy Town. Thanks again for listening and sharing. Tired of a public education system that rewards mediocrity? Want little junior to kick ass and forget names? <laughs> then why not send your future CEO to the only school system designed to turn Johnny into a class AAA rated corporate leader of tomorrow? An education curriculum designed by legendary General Electric CEO Jack Welsh. Your child will learn the most ruthless cutthroat, and profit-maximizing schemes that made Jack the most venerated and feared corporate kingpin in America. School philosophy is consistent from the classroom to the playground. 10% of kids are expelled each year for underperformance. (laughs) And instead of calming inspired games like running under the lofted parachute, your kid will be cutting the parachute cords with his ankle knife. (laughs) Jack Welsh Charter Schools for Tomorrow CEOs. Where sociopathy is not just normalized, it's rewarded. Crazy town. Da, 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 crazy town.